This evening, we go to Sweden, uh, where we've been once before. We, we spoke to retired Professor Roland Gustafsson, who was uh, um, for many years at Alnarp, um, and um, very learning a little bit about the, the really interesting things that do go on in Sweden in the, in the landscape world. But um, so this evening, I'd like to introduce you to Mariana Vodovasov, who I first met about four years ago uh, when we were leading a garden tour to, to Spain based on Madrid um, and a gardener for the Stockholm municipality turned up. Um, and uh, so that was when we met, met Mariana. Um, so first of all, Mariana, um, how do you get into horticulture? Well, that's interesting. I, I was thinking it was my first memories of, of, you know, garden and stuff like that. And well, I wasn't a gardener, actually, from the beginning. <laughs> I was a project manager in, in PR and communication and, and work as a press secretary for many years. And uh, so I'm, I'm one of those have, that have done career changing in, in sort of midlife. <laughs> uh, so but why I ended up? Well, I think I think um, it has to do a lot about um, having this the thing that everybody calls, talks about having a, wor a work that feels meaningful. But I'm not actually Swedish. Uh, I came to Sweden as a political refugee with my family when I was five. So I mentioned that to Noel, I'm actually not Swedish. And he said, well, but not being Swedish maybe means that you can see what is typical Swedish. And I thought about that, well, maybe I can. The perspectives I'm giving you today are mostly from, from my horizon of working in municipalities. I actually never worked in the municipality of Stockholm. I always worked in the municipalities in the suburb of Stockholm, yeah. which are, yeah. in, you know, other, other structures. So I've been working in Huddinge Kommun, Haning Kommun, Botkyrka Kommun, but it doesn't say anything to you. But there are the big municipalities in the south of Stockholm. Uh, so, well, as somebody, some, there's always someone who asks about my name. And just to, to clear that out, uh, I was born in Argentina and I speak Spanish. And I came to Sweden when I was five. But um, my great grandmother, she fled from Odessa in the beginning of the 20th century. And she was fleeing from the pogroms. You know, the, they were killing the Jews in the city of Odessa in that area. So that's my name, and that's also why I have the, the male uh, ending, because it sort of stopped with me. <laughs> um, so Vodovosov, otherwise there should be Vodovosofa, but it's not. The A um, ending, O-V-A. Yes. Yeah, precisely, yes. exactly. So I sort of represent a long line of refugees, and I usually, when I work with kids, I tell people have feet, and and plants have roots, but that's not really true because we have roots too. And we sort of leave that when we are forced to flee. And uh, the reason we fled was we, that a military dictatorship in Argentina. And I was, I was just a kid. And uh, well, it's one of the darkest moments of Argentinian history, I think. Um, much violence and many, many lost and uh, families separated and thousands of unexplained disappearance, much like what we are seeing in the war in Ukraine now. Uh, so, but that was another conflict. So we may have feet and we have to move around in the, this world and we may all be at some point refugees. So I know a lot about the experience of being a refugee child and uh, losing family either by death or distance, but uh, also about leaving everything and starting all over again. And I think you will notice that when I talk about uh, my passion for what I do, it's uh, sort of the voice of a survivor. So I, I start here because it, it, I will talk a lot more about that, but it's important because it has a lot to do with the work I do today. Uh, and, uh, well, you can't return. Mostly when you're a refugee, you seldom have the possibility to return and you have to live with parents who dream with returning. And you actually can't really return to what you left. You can return to what's at the moment, but not what you left. And that's an interesting realization with being a child, understanding that. 
So I usually say that it was the experience of being a refugee that made me a project manager. <laughs> Because you sort of, it's a survival skill you sort of have to get. Uh, and when you asked him about how I got into horticulture, and I think that's probably be mean, be mean, being four, I think, four, three or four years old, and being pushed in a stroller and looking up at the canopy in a, a park in Buenos Aires and seeing the canopy of the jacaranda tree. You probably know the color. It's a beautiful color, somewhere between blue and lilac. It's, it's so difficult to describe. And They're so extraordinary, these amazing yes, kind of yes. purple violet. And, oh, and Buenos Aires is known yeah. for these uh, enormous yeah. all, uh, alleys uh, and after the, the avenues. And they were actually designed and planted by an Englishman. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so that's my first horticultural memory, actually. I and mean, it's a very strong memory. And it's one of my few memories from Argentina. So once again, being a refugee. So when you ask me how it turned out to be a gardener, well, I, I, in my mid thirties, I did a career change and I decided to become a gardener. It was very important for me. And uh, probably a life crisis, you know, my father died and stuff like that. But, but also, it was something I really needed to do. And I think a lot of people who have done this career changing knows this is, is a question of, you have to do it. Otherwise, you can't really live. It's difficult to explain. So the Swedish system, uh, educational system, offers you possibility of something called higher vocational education, which is a post-secondary form of education that combines theoretical and practical studies. And that's what you do if you want to be uh, get the title gardener in Sweden. That's, that's, that's what you do. Uh, and uh, that's what I did. And Sweden has a fantastic system for stu student financial aid. And by this time, I'm mid thirties, I had no, nothing left because I had already done a seven year at university studying, you know, studying humanities and theater and film and stuff like that. But when you do that, you sort of end, end up doing something else and what, what you dream. So gardening turned out to be my dream. And uh, uh, this possibility to study is what makes Sweden one of the countries that has the highest educational levels in the world, because you give a sec you are given a second chance, either like me when you change your career or you sort of haven't had the choice to do education. You can sort of educate yourself. So I was actually doing PR marketing and working as a press secretary when I did the change, and people thought you're crazy. You will never earn as much as you do now. You will never be a, a a boss, <laughs> uh, but what I was doing was I was doing marketing an event. And when you communicate with people, you need to talk with people. And one of the things I was doing was involving citizens in, um, involving citizens in Swedish democracy is a question of, you have to do it because it's a democracy. So you have to have this dialogue with people when you do develop places. And uh, when you ask people what they want in the area where they live or they study, uh, when given the question, the answer is always, and it almost never fails, they want green spaces, they want parks, they want playgrounds, and of course, public transport, good schools, affordable housing, and sort of security. But on the top of the list, you always find something with green. <laughs> And that's what I was doing. And at some point I realized I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do and I wasn't doing what people wanted. So that's why I became a gardener. <laughs> um, so, and I have, I did two year studies. I studied in Ian Shopping. I'm very much in the tradition of Pete Udolf's work, work of style of working, and uh, also the municipality maintenance level uh, that has sort of find a match there with Pete's designs and, and, and the municipality's way of working. And um, the parks in Ian Shopping turn out to be our classroom. So that's where I learn everything I know almost about gardening. So if I don't know, maybe I answered the question of how and how I became a gardener, <laughs> how I did it. 
Well, I, I think perhaps we should say a little bit. Will, will you say a little bit more about end shopping later, or should we talk about end shopping now? We could say something. I think end yeah. shopping is a fantastic small little city um, um, that decided that parks were the. Th well, you know, when there was, they, they, they had this um, head gardener that decided that parks were the thing in this little city. And, uh, well, I think you could tell the rest of the story. He, he met Piet at some conference. Yes, and... Steph, Stefan Matson. I mean, his yeah. budget was a completely ordinary budget, but he was just extraordinarily clever at making the most of it. And in terms of, I think one of his great innovations were these pocket parks, using yeah. really small bits of, of land um, and making really quality uh, planting, quality mini landscapes. And so um, Ain Shopping began to get this reputation as, as, as a city for really good parks, but not you know through, through good management rather than, than spending lots of money. And the story was, of course, that uh, he met Pete Aldolf on a coach trip at the tour at the Perennial Perspectives Conference in Freising, just outside Munich. And I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was 1995. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. Yes, he was. Um, and and, and they was, they was on, on the bus together. And, and Stefan said to Pete, as a sort of um, kind of wind up, really, um, all these perennials you grow, will they grow in Sweden? Um, and Pete said, well, of course they will. And he confessed to me later that he had absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, and, and Stefan said, well, maybe, and Ste Stefan actually said as a joke, well, maybe you should come and plant a, a park for us in, in Sherping. And Pete said, well, yes, I will. Um, and uh, so Stefan then, 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 then commissioned him. Yeah, is it true that that was Pete's first uh, public commission? It was his first public. Pro well, he did a small border in the Botanic Garden in Utrecht, uh, which is quite near him in in, in Holland. Uh, but no, this was his first major public project, the, the the Dream Park. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I was talking about: the Dream Park and the small pocket parks. That was my classroom, actually, and uh, with that, uh, in shopping municipality got in the forefront, got in the garden illustrator and whatever, but also in the forefront of how you should manage public green spaces. And they're still doing a very good work. I haven't been there in a while, but, but uh, it opened my eye with my municipality background, how we should work with the green spaces and how we have to take care of them and maintenance and the, the importance of them was, was, was a big, big thing for me. Uh, so when I came back to my municipality, now a gardener, I uh, I uh, kept working with you know planning and 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 being a pain in the ass for my colleagues about how we design spaces, and I started working with playgrounds and why were they not more green, and um, so I've been I kept working with with in the same area, not as a gardener. I kept on as a project manager, but using my communication skills, my experience from talking to people, knowing what people want, and sort of mixing it up with, with planning, urban development, which is what I know. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, well, eventually I got to start gardening in the municipality, and I start working with teenagers and uh, when you know their first job experience I, I think I talked about this last time I, I would talk to you but it's a wonderful thing uh, to work with with kids they're about 15 17 it's the first working experience and well maintenance is not that fun uh, weeding is not fun so how do you make it fun so uh, with different methods we start working with uh, Introducing them to edible garden, guerrilla gardening, nature, environment and climate issues and sort of awareness of social issues in different ways. And you can do that, all that by sharing your knowledge about gardening and maintenance. And it's incredible. There are, uh, it's one of my best moments when you see the light in the eye of somebody who actually gets how everything comes together in the public spaces. So 
I've been doing uh, that for a couple of years, and then I had to stop when the pandemic came. And uh, I, I think in the future I would do more that sort of work uh, with different groups in, in the society. But kids are just great. Um, well, you asked me about the, the, the garden scene in, in Sweden for a moment there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you have some questions about how old is it and, and what is the tradition. And um, the first important garden I was, uh, gardener I was thinking about was actually not Swedish. It was French. And uh, I will get back to him. But recently, horticultural studies have shown, have, have, you, have you noticed that this is a new interesting area called, called horticulture archaeology, which is really interested, interesting. Uh, Recently in Sweden, uh, there came a new book and there are new finds that we for a long time thought that gardening started when, with uh, monasteries, but it's not true. People, people have been gardening for a long time before the monasteries came along. And during the Viking age, uh, now with uh, this ar new archaeology, you actually, it turns out that there was a big horticulture exchange during Viking times, and they are finding fruits and seeds when they do the archaeology, and they can find, you know, peaches and grapes and stuff like that. Everyone thought that came with the monks, but it's not true. They, people have been growing stuff for a long time. So back to the French guy. Well, in 1648, André Mollet, a very famous French um, Gardner, head gardener, was summoned to Sweden by Queen uh, Christina. She decided that she wanted a royal park design. And she, showed, she, he, she sort of gave him 18 gardeners and four horses and said, do something with this. And this poor French guy, he, he tried to do some sym symmetrical planting, you know, outside the castle. And, and they had to move houses and there were roads. They couldn't get the symmetry correctly. And then he realized uh, he had to struggle with the fact that uh, plants didn't really work <laughs> in Sweden the way they did in, you know, Versailles or whatever. So, but that's, and that's, that area is still there in the middle of Stockholm. Uh, it doesn't look like it looked in the time of Moni. Every, every era has sort of changed the, the face of, of the garden, but that is Kunstegården, the, the King's Garden. And it's, Usually you go to concerts there now and, 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 and cafes. And there's not much horticulture at the moment, some tulips, but anyhow. So, you know, it's not very long. The, depends how you see. The, 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 the traditional horticulture history is long if you sort of think mm -hmm. about ordinary people, but, you know, more, more famous people doesn't really, really work. Okay, I will skip Carl Linnea because... Uh, well, we all know about him. Uh, yes. Okay, we, I will skip them. But I, I, will, I will tell you that I'm a member of Sweden, Sweden's oldest organization for gardeners, uh, founded in 1848. Uh, and the, the name is Gartnersenskapet, which means gardener society, but it's a German word. So now you realized by the 1848, we were very in the German style. <laughs> uh, even the name of the organization is, is German. And uh, sometimes I think I should have been there in 1848 because the, the horticulture business at that time uh, was sort of the, what should we say? the well, like the tech industry now, you know, the, the thing to be in. Cutting edge, the cutting yeah, edge. Yeah, cutting edge. edge. And, and um, gardening was sort of the future, I think, seeing it that per perspective. And the focus was, was producing fruit and vegetables of good quality, improving production. And of course, there were only men in this society by 1848. But... Um, this garden society was very important for the uh, higher education and horticultural skills. So we have a nice tradition to look back on, but not very, no equality in that perspective. Uh, and recently studies have shown a part of the history that has been forgotten. And now I'm sort of jumping to the early 20th century, 
and that was the horticultural schools for women. Women, I think you have those in England too, uh, but nobody really had written their story yet. And in Sweden, there's a lot of people researching at the moment, and that was really interesting. It was part of the uh, eman emancipation of women, and and long before the Swedish women got the vote, they started working as as gardeners and got educated to be gardeners. What sort of dates are we talking about here? A beginning of, you know, 1910. Nine, uh, Sim very similar to England, actually. Yes, right? I know. First, and I, I've seen yeah. those great pictures of women dressed like real gardeners working. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But, but it's not, not much is being written about this period. So when you look for role model, models and you're a woman, you don't really find women gardeners mm. like that in, in Sweden. But I have one I would like to speak about, if you let me. Uh, she has a very special place in my heart, and she's, her name is Anna Lindhagen. And uh, her and the one other one I was going to talk about, Ulla Molin, no one of them were gardeners. Interesting, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Well, Anna Lindhagen uh, is one of the few women in Stockholm who has a little park with her name, and that used to be her vegetable garden, her own garden. And um, she was the pioneer and founder of the Swedish allotment movement, allotment movement. And that's, uh, that's interesting for a woman. When she founded this organization, she, didn't even, she wasn't even allowed to vote because women didn't have the vote in Sweden by then. And uh, she, was, she became a social democrat politician, but she was a social worker and she worked in the poorest part of the city. And... Uh, she also, part of her work was to defend this cultural history of, of Stockholm um, and the green spaces. She often talked about the green spaces, not just making sure the buildings um, got restored and, and were left and not demolished, but the green spaces around the buildings, just to show how important those were for people. And uh, it's actually thanks to her, her you can walk around in Stockholm and see an old part of Stockholm that it don't exist in many places. Uh, there were areas that were slum areas, uh, but with old buildings that have been preserved and now very picturesque and very expensive, of course. But um, she also was the founder of the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. And uh, she advocated native plants in garden. And by people thought she was a big, you know, you always, as a gardener, you always want to grow things that are exotic or so. And she talked about the native things and the pocket park that used to be her little, her little garden. She planted it up with a collection of plants that she collected in the Stockholm archipelago. So resilient and sustainable was her motto long before we talked about that. Mm -hmm. And she died before the Second World War uh, ended. And by then, a second generation of important women comes along, and uh, that's Ulla Molin. And you, some of you may have heard of her. She wasn't a gardener either. She started as a journalist writing about garden in magazines in the 30s, and uh, she later became a, an editor for a very influential magazine. And it was through her magazines and books she really influenced the vision of what is beauty and how should homes and gardens look like in a sort of Swedish perspective, in a social, social democratic perspective. And she has these great ideas of how, how things should look. And by the end of the 60s, she left her editor work and started working as a garden designer. She also did this career change. And her focus was creating small gardens, very simple with plants and color, good plants and color combinations. And uh, what interested her was the boundary, uh, taking away the boundary be between uh, inside and outside. Uh, and she worked with uh, a lot of ground covers uh, instead of uh, lawns. And she's a very interesting aesthetic way of working, very beautiful. And um, well, she sort of has formed the way we think about our gardeners, uh, gardens and, and 
the 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 space we sort of build in them and the functions also uh, and her own garden is preserved and can be visited and it's very beautiful i recommend everybody who has the possibility and there's also this uh, prize or scholarship in her name that um, it's very prestigious prize to get yeah. so two generations of women during the 20th century i think and and role models in different ways and none of them were gardeners i, I still find that interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. so i think you always want to know what happened i think you asked me before we started this about the 50s and 70s yes, didn't yes. You? I, uh, I did yes because i had the sense uh, of talking to swedish colleagues that the uh, the sort of early or the mid part of the 20th century was actually a very good time for gardening in, in Sweden. And then when Pete was commissioned to do the Dream Park in Enköping, you know, that was the start of a kind of re great, great rediscovery of perennials. And, and it, sound, it sounded as if a lot of perennials had simply gone out of cultivation prior to that project, which was got mid-1990. Mid so what, what, what happened? Yes, what happened? Well, it's very interesting. It has <clears> to do with architecture. Gardens and architecture, it always hangs together. Well. The, the focus between the 60s and 70s and 80s were much about uh, building and the planning and building of what we call the million program. Something can be translated the one million new homes project. And in 1965, I think the government took a decision that they were to build a uh, one million homes uh, and to eliminate the great housing shortage uh, and there was to be modern houses at reasonable prices for sort of industrial workers to be able to live there and uh, I, this has been seen all over the world but in Sweden it meant that um, these residential areas were built uh, and uh, well, you know what I mean, you have shops and community service, everything in the middle and then like some big, big buildings um, and often traffic separation because pedestrians and car park really cross. Um, so, well, the traffic situation was new, but they have been building in that way and planning in that way. What happened during these years is to get up to, to get to the level of one million uh, you really have to bring up the scales. So the big areas were built in very high, tall buildings. And in the Swedish tradition of architecture, uh, something is very important is the, the access to nature and the woods uh, areas are important. So when these big projects were incorporated in green spaces, nature, um, they sort of kept the green areas around these enormous residential areas as nature, green spaces, something you can't really call it park and definitely not a garden. It's so more it's only, well, 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 essentially unmanaged. Un, yeah. un, un yes, I was coming to not, that. Not gone, and not and gone. Uh, yeah. very low maintenance, which was part of this idea. Everything was to be cheap and accessible for everyone. So that means that a kid like me, I grew up in such an area. And I had a wonderful access to nature, not meeting cars at all, enormous areas to play in. And, and I have my first meeting with nature in, in a, you know, in my, as growing up. Uh, and I often defend these places, uh, residential areas, because mm -hmm. they're seen as, as ugly and often too big and a lot of social problems. But, um, in the planning perspective, they are really, really well planned. And uh, what we are doing at the moment is we're sort of dancing them up, we're building more houses and we're sort of taking away the few very good qualities about nature. Mm -hmm. But that aspect did have had to do with why it didn't happen so much in the horticultural side, I think, because mm -hmm. there were not much job opportunities if you wanted to do something spectacular because nobody was really doing that. You had to have, mm -hmm. you know, very rich clients or something like that. And well, um, with that said, I would say there's a lot of very good landscape architects that worked in these housing areas and did great jobs. And many of them were women. And we sort of keep forgetting their names because 
when we develop these areas, what they plan and design is so we're losing that. Is that a good answer? I think it's the best I can do. Yes, yes. No, I, I think it's a, it's a complex problem. But I think it, to some extent it happened in a, in a lot of West European countries that there was um, a, a drop off. I'm mean, just thinking of well, Holland, actually. I mean, Munich House was designing some amazing gardens around public housing in the 1950s. But by the 1960s, I think maintenance costs were, were meaning a lot of them were being eliminated. And there was that a sort of rather deadening effect of the need yeah. for min min minimizing costs. And in Sweden, we, in the 70s, there was this fuel crisis. Uh, I, I, I was too young to remember that. And that sort of killed off the nurseries in Sweden. Uh, oh, so, oh, so we yes, started yes. imported plants from uh, oh, Holland. Right. So yes. that that was another thing, great thing that yeah. structure that yes. changed the yeah. the, yes. the industry. Yes. Yes. Well, okay. So I think these green spaces that we're talking about now, these low maintenance spaces that are still there uh, in many places, are sort of the future for horticulture now. Because we're running out of places of making green, <laughs> we're building so much. These areas have enormous, enormous potential. And um, instead, instead of densifying them with urban development, um, we should we should do wonderful things with them. And one of them things I we come back to that later is editable gardens, editable plantings. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. we can get back to that later. Yes. But yes. but I think. That's one of the things that it has, is really important. And there's one point you, you just touched on there, but I think when we were talking about this before, you made it much more forcefully but regarding Ulla Malin um, and, and women working, designing. Planting design is inevitably more transitory, more transient than yeah. anything involving concrete and paving. Yeah. Uh, we tend to we tend to remember more the landscapes architects I think uh, by the good gardeners they sort of disappear when the maintenance is not there uh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's I have some examples I will I think I, I will mention Mona she's a very yeah. good example of, of Mona, some, yeah, Mona in yeah. Gothenburg yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, okay so um, do we move on to sort of garden garden business more generally and women now i think we can yes yes and i think it would yeah. be in, in certain, and certainly my <laughs> feeling is that the garden scene in, in sweden now is very lively I mean, it's been, been a few years since i was there but i mean some amazing developments uh, in municipalities and in um, house around housing cooperatives uh, but also a, a, a lot of interest in in private gardens and, and garden festivals um, yes. in Helsing, Helsingborg. Yeah, places. yeah, yeah. So I, I myself did that tulip festival two three years ago, and yeah. that was a great great fun. Uh, really, so really, yeah. so yeah. more more, I think the pandemic also has sort of made us realize how important green yes, spaces yeah. are. Yes. But yeah. back to the business, I think yeah, this is a there is a gener a change of generation now yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, you can actually see that it, it's very i don't know you, you you feel it and you see it it's a generation that's leaving yeah. and a new is coming the the news new people who are coming are of, often people like me career changers that yeah, have yeah. A, another experience have been working in other parts of society and are coming in and working in this area so if you study to be a gardener you probably your classmates will probably be all all be women uh, one or two guys in, in uh, every class why, why, why do you think that is well i i think it's it's about the romanticization of being a gardener but i think it also is um i don't know it's a, there is a creative aspect in gardening that that is important i think and if you don't really get that in other areas, traditionally women areas, you know, working nurse or teacher yeah, yeah. or whatever. Um, I don't know really what it is. I know the problem is that the, the pay is going down. I don't know why, but that's what happens when a lot of women decide to do something, the pay goes down. Well, that, that, I mean, any sociologist of, of, of gender will, will, will tell you that that happens and that that has been one of my worries that we you know, for, for a while there was a point when it felt very very sort of balanced but i mean that that is a you know a commonly accepted yeah mm -hmm. the, there is another problem um yeah, yeah. that i think has to do a bit with this and this um 
you know the thing of titles you know i can't call myself a gardener i have i have a degree i can show that but there's a lot of people who do evening courses and and short um, um, education training yeah. And call this, um, themselves gardeners or gardener designers and stuff like that. And uh, I'm one for, I, I love the idea that people want to garden, but to, to do gardening and be in horticulture. But I find this is an issue I think we sooner or later have to address because uh, it's important for the client or whatever who hires you to know what you know, what is your level of knowledge. And and, and without being a party pooper, I think we need some form of standards for that. And mm, mm, mm. we don't really have that in Sweden at the moment. Uh, everyone can call themselves a gardener or a gardener. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's a problem. Mm, uh, yeah. If you want to see it as a problem, maybe it's not a problem. It's just a question of structuring it up. Uh, so the interest is there. People want to do working horticulture. Uh, I was thinking about the other thing that I think is a problem is the fact that when women work in horticulture um, sort of the structure for it is still very ma male what's the word um, equipment and work planning is not really adapted to sort of our bodies yes. and uh, what I see uh, is a lot of uh, work injuries and the fact that uh, you keep guarding as when you come to you know 50s and you never make it to to become um what's the word when you sort of retire you you have it, you know the body aches and and you have injuries. So you have to retire you have to leave work earlier yeah. in your retirement and, and that's, yes, a, that's, yes. a, that's something yeah, i see yeah. happens yeah. more with women with women and with men yeah, yeah, at the yeah. moment and i think mm. it's the way the horticulture business is structured has mm. to change yes, uh, yes. And I was thinking um, something that could be the, the change, changing the, you know, the, of, of this is that the concept of susten sus sustainability um, may bring change because you need to have knowledge to work with that. And that's yes. what everyone is asking about. So when this, all these young women come out from, have done their training and, uh, and start working, I think maybe at some point we can sort of turn that around and say, well, okay, you want my knowledge, you have to pay me. Uh, yes, and yes. That, that can only happen if we sort of st stop competing with firms uh, and municipalities that employ personnel without green knowledge. And yes. I'm sorry to say, mostly of them are men and foreign labor. Mm -hmm. So that's really a problem, and I'm, yes, I'm, yes. I'm 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 used to work with that sort of, of uh, groups with men. Workforce, Sometimes yes. they don't even speak Swedish, uh, and some of them know a lot. But some of them are there because nothing else has been offered them, and yes, they yes, they're yes. not very interested. <laughs> but no, you know, no. they can you know they mm -hmm. go around with the lonely more and whatever noisy stuff like noisy that. equipment. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so I think the idea of the crisis, climate crisis mm. may help uh, and start the society to appreciate more the, the, the mm. green efforts. And the fact the pandemic also shown that green areas are important and they need maintenance. And that's where gardeners come in, I think. That's the best I can say. Um, I, I wish for a future where things change. For At the moment, it's not... It's not very good. And I know this is sort of worldwide situation. Um, but if we if we if we will be able to to work and rise the level of horticulture, uh, mm. I think it's going to be those women doing that. <laughs> yes. I mean, there's something a, a point I find myself making a, a, again and again is that uh, we actually need a new profession in a way that, that combines the skills and awareness of horticulturalists and ecologists, because yeah. if we're moving towards more naturalistic planting, which actually, which of course does require a lot less labour to maintain, but it needs a lot more knowledge and skill. Uh, it, uh, there's a whole set of kind of, um, well, what are essentially ecological yeah. Yeah. Scale ecological knowledge, which, which needs to be com combined with traditional horticultural skills, and so, so that that is, you know, we have and, this model perhaps of a, yeah, of a, of a new kind uh, of horticultural professional. 
Yeah, and to get that, you have to need uh, a client or employee that really wants that. Yes, so yes. it's a balance. I will get back to that because I think that is important. You asked me about uh, some well-known uh, women in horticulture and uh, living at this moment and active. And I couldn't think of anyone actually a woman, but I, I could mention two men. The yes. first one, people who are listening should probably know that is Ulf Nordfjell. And uh, he's sort of, well, you sort of really know when you see something designed by him, it can't, it just is Ulf Nordfjell. And sometimes it's very Scandinavian and bringing in nature and, and well, it's, it's, it's a, he's, he, you can see it's the, in the design and in the plants, you can really see without really knowing it. And he's, of course, best known for Chelsea Flower Show and stuff like that. But he had uh, been to Chelsea twice, I think. Yeah, I think. yeah. and he, I think he's been winning a lot. But nowadays he's focusing, fo focusing on a huge private estate in Stockholm and doing some gardens in the French Riviera. Uh, but I do know that Ulf is planning uh, for a new book that comes next year, I think. Uh, yeah. I didn't mention that, but I'm on the board no. of uh, the jury for the oh, Swiss really? Book uh, Award yeah. of the Year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I actually visited this uh, private estate, and it's very, very, very impressive. I'm not allowed to say the name of the castle, so you more or less get the, <laughs> yes, <laughs> get the idea of what yes. sort of work he does and uh, yes, which sort yes. of clients he has now. But yes, I yes. Like, I, we, we, like I think we all have this. We all have this sort of rather stereotypical vision of, of, of Sweden as being wonderfully egalitarian, but of course it's uh, not quite like that. No, it's not quite like that. But I, I would like to mention that he started working designing parks and public spaces. Is is part of his fame is that he got new clients, I think, and yeah, and yeah, yeah. the fact that he does wonderful gardens. But I would like to mention another guy, same generation. His name is Torsten Berlin. Mm. And he's not so well known outside no, no, Sweden, no, no, no. but I did my trainee with him and my and his colleagues, and he's um, he's a uh, he has another style. He's not yeah. so bombastic. He has this fantastic way of very subtle way of creating within nature. In in that aspect, he's sort of very Swedish, and yeah. uh, he has an extremely knowledge of plants and. Uh, I think the best things he, ha he has done are things that he have done in very difficult places. He has this island outside in the Swedish and Stockholm archipelago. And uh, his garden, his private garden there is so beautiful uh, and yes. actually sustainable. It doesn't, he, he do not water it. it, it, it he's creating within nature, nation, uh, nature and it's, it's really beautiful. Um, and he also writes books and, and so he's, he's very well known. It's a nice guy and should should get more attention. Of course, Torsten also has very rich clients. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as you said, they're all there. Uh, but I was thinking, well, okay, who, who do we talk about who maybe isn't a landscape, landscape architect, but... Uh, does interesting things and you mentioned Mona Holmberg which I had yeah. as a teacher and uh, um, for me horticulture is very important and inspiring when it can be shared by many and uh, that's that's very important to me and yes there are uber rich clients in Sweden too but I, I prefer public parks and gardens and it's a choice I, I actually made and um, and when we talk about future and sustain, sustainability and diversity, it's not the uber rich that has taken lead in this development. Mm -hmm. It's the municipalities of Sweden, as Ian Shopping, for That's example. Yeah. And we are the ones, you know, at the moment growing meadows and choosing plants that can withstand water and working out better maintenance methods and trying to out edible the gardens, mm. but also planning and designing and giving assignments to wonderful, for wonderful, wonderful green spaces for everyone. And that's where Mona comes in because mm. she works together with her husband, Ulf, and she has this background from the botanical garden yeah, in yeah. Gothenburg. Mm. Mm. But her planting designs are 
fantastic. There are like magic combination of color and structures and they are so beautiful. And uh, where does she work? Well, she works with housing companies, housing cooperative, cooperatives and municipalities. And they are very, they are splendid, yeah, splendid. Yeah. Could, could I does. just interrupt and just give some background? I remember we had a, I think it was a Gardens Illustrated magazine tour to Sweden quite a few years ago, um, probably, probably 15 years ago, and we went to, we met up with Mona and we went to an estate which was apparently a bit of a troublesome estate in Gotham. Yeah. And it was just, we were just blown away by these wonderful plantings and the interpretation that was the, each big planting had, had a notice with a list of all the plants, all colour themed. It was just so Im Im impressive. We, uh, and uh, she, yeah. she, she has this wonderful way of working, yeah. besides the fact that she's a magician, I mean, I must say that. Mm -hmm. uh, she checks the planting yearly together with the maintenance staff, which yeah. means that you can sort of turn a corner and see one of her wonderful plantings in, in sort of public space or a park or in a residential area. And that's how we should work. And especially uh, municipalities should make sure that we give assignments to people like her, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So, so well, that's what that's my view about about sharing horticulture, and that's mm -hmm. the way to do it, I think. Mm -hmm. And with that, her ideas of low maintenance, uh, not so much watering, and and still looking fabulous. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. Uh, and uh, so this is. I think something like a mission for me in what I do. And uh, I think I didn't mention what I do. At the moment, I am uh, um, in charge of the inauguration of a park that has been um, refurbished, I think is the word. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, let's see if I find the thing I wanted to tell you about. Uh, and uh, it's the result of this dialogue with citizens I was talking about in the beginning. And um, it's a, well, it's a residential area, a neighborhood with what is called low social economics. So, you know, it, yeah, yeah. people struggle there. Yes, and yeah. just, just like a place where I grow, grow up. And there's a lot of nature and the park is the center of this area. And when you ask people, what's the best with the place Judbru? It's called Judbru. People say, I, we like our park. So yes. it's so important. As I told you, people answer, they like green spaces. So for a couple of years, we've been doing first this dialogue and um, asking them what they want, what they wish, what, what are their needs, how they use the park. And slowly, slowly, we every year we're doing more and more stuff. And well, you sort of... Uh, We've been planting more trees and they ask for more edible things. So we are doing a uh, part of the, of, the, of the park is going to be an edible garden. And uh, we remade, re remade the playground and um, improved lighting and, you know, security measures. And we planted a lot of bulbs. So keep, keep, people keep asking for flowers. So, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's not... It's not very elevated horticultural level, but it could be. And I'm very curious about how this edible garden is going to work with maintenance. But mm -hmm. there are, yes, yes, people really yes. like the idea of be, being able to. Uh, it's, it's a good way also to interact with people. And part of my job is more than just doing the integration. It's also about um, activating the place, inviting people to come. So I'm in charge of, you know, the, the theater and music and <laughs> events and stuff like that. But I keep talking to people and the more you talk to people, the more you learn about what they need, what they like. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a security to know that, well, we do this, but it's going to work. Yes, yes. You have the dialogue with people. Otherwise you do maintenance, you, you sort of refurbish something, you go away. And it doesn't really work. You have to stay there and be there. So yes, that's, yes. that's the way. And it's a new way of working. And if you bring horticulture to that, people realize very quickly something good is going to happen in our neighborhood. And yes. sometimes that makes a change in a neighborhood. Yes. 
yes, it upgrades <coughs> upgrades everyone's expectations and behavior. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you sort of put in some kids that do their summer job and they take yes. care of the place, they have ownership and they feel empowered by that. And you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a cycle that can go up and can go down. It's important yes. is to make it go up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, um, so I, I've been working with gardening in, you know, municipality perspective. It may don't, not be the Chelsea Flower Show, but um, we share horticulture. Which is far more people, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And, um, and, la I and, know, I and lasts been... a bit longer, I think. Yes, yeah, yes. and I haven't been to the Shelter Flower Show. I only, you know, you've never been. At... Oh, no. well, <laughs> oh, you've missed your chance. You've missed your chance. I, re I think it's, it peaked about probably in the early two thousands. It's completely gone off the boil now. No, you missed, you, you missed your chance there. <laughs> There's other good stuff. Like... It used to be the life story of my life. I always missed the chance. Everything was better when I <laughs> before me. But I, what I was going to say is that. Okay, these municipalities, we have a, a very important mission here. And um, uh, when, I, when, I, when I work with kids, I, 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 I see that I sort of, I'm passing my experience of wonder of nature and the sense of respect. And I'm trying to give them knowledge that, it, that it's possible to, to create and grow. And uh, I sometimes think it's, it's what they need to be able to cope with the future. Don't you think? It's not looking very good at the moment to be able to grow your own food. I think that's a knowledge we all probably will need in, in the near future. And uh, so these public spaces, gardens, playgrounds, whatever, are so important. That's what form us and make us citizens and to put, to, to try to level the, the, the to, to ha level the horticultural level, I think, is where you should put your effort, I think. And also um, employing people like Mona to make yeah. sure that you can do magic with little resources and good knowledge and good maintenance. And she actually teaches the, you know, the personnel of the munici municipality or whatever. Just I think perhaps we should get Mona on to do a webinar for us, perhaps. Yes, I think so. I would yes. love to hear her. Oh, great. Yeah, because we, it's a long time since I've, I've met up with her. Um, yeah. Now, we've had a question coming in, which I think is very relevant to what you're talking about, which is, a, do you have a short list of the features of well-designed green space that, that you feel is... is that is particularly special to to you know, the, the, the public Sweden. areas. Yeah. yeah okay. Public areas. Yes. Well, yeah. there's sort of the traditional landscape architects um, uh, functions that you sort of put in in parks and areas. I think it also varies where this area is, what sort of uh, neighborhood is it. Uh, but it, there's there's a base of things that must be there. I think to you know recreational areas uh, in this park i'm working with now we have this rather big area sitting areas with uh, to to be able to meet up and to you know barbecue and stuff like that yeah. and maybe I, I wouldn't have designed something like that in a more less what should i call it more swedish neighborhood because yes. we okay. swedish people don't meet up that way and no, no. the way you place the, mm. the the park bench is really yes. important you can't mm. put them too far because then people can't meet and talk okay. yes. So, yes. so that's that's sort of the that, structure yeah, that, that, that differ, dif differentiation of of, uh, of space yeah. Yeah, yeah. but the uh, good playgrounds is always important uh, and that's something that my experience people really, really amazing at and you know, really imaginative playgrounds uh, i remember yeah malmo was really famous for that at some point yeah. that day. it's just really imaginative and using planting and often making things that are considerably cheaper than buying all this really expensive off the peg uh play equipment and next time you come to to sweden you should visit orebro they have done a wonderful work with a project i sort of started in the beginning when i got back to the municipality about um, green playgrounds, which is so interesting because you always think, well, kids and, and, and plants don't work together. That's bullshit. That's the best thing you can do is integrate the green yes, spaces yes. And, and 
make the bush, bushes an interesting place to, to play and, and there's so much one can do, but you yeah. have to think outside the box and, and sort of leave maintenance behind in, in this aspect when it comes to kids. Because I'm so tired of people, you know, they're sort of cleaning away everything the kids have collected to build something fantastic and they sort of <laughs> sweep it away and I get so angry because they have like you lose your imagination when you grow old <laughs> you can see it's it's the result of playing it's so interesting and uh, we need to get that nature in in the playground so the children experience that wonder of nature otherwise we won't make it i think in this in this world and with the future um and we have a question from ulla about uh, basically about about, about <laughs> about tra training training and teaching of staff i mean <laughs> you've, made, you've made a few references to to, to people working in, in public space but i mean you know what is the typical uh training program well uh, to work in municipalities if they have their own personnel uh you are you have to have show that you i have to have a cv and show you have been you have trained or you've been working for a long time uh, the trouble comes when you so don't have your own staff and you have to bring in firms. That's when you can't really control what they know. But um, what I did when I worked last time in in uh, Honing Municipality, I worked with the personnel and I I arranged courses and um, and uh, invited people to come and lecture and um, we make sure everyone had the knowledge for what they were doing, um, certificates and stuff like that, um, and discussions. A big discussion was, uh, should we, what, sh what should we do about the grass? Should we cut it as we do or, or leave it to, to get longer? Uh, it's, it's a question of, of sustainability and biodiversity. And it was a real struggle because people who, you know, if you work is to mow lawns for 30 years, you you get uh, very scared when people say you don't need to do that anymore. That's not good for the environment. You get very defensive. So it's a, it's a question of slowly changing around the way people think about their work. It's, it's very, you know, satisfying turning around and say, oh, I did all this. But if you don't do that, what do you do instead? Uh, and finding new forms of maintenance about that has been sort of an interesting issue. Uh, also, make sure that if you have staff that is very not 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 knowledgeable, uh, when some young people comes and want to do trainee periods, uh, make sure you team up with them so they get a good mentor. That's really important. That's I sometimes think that's more or less the reason I'm still in horticulture. I got a very good mentor in one of the trainee places I, I was at, and. Uh, and that is very important, and especially if you want personnel to work in the municipality area, if you want to work, you, you want the best staff, don't you? And uh, that's important. And uh, something else I think is important to change, to have different generations working alongside each other. That's sort of good, good discussions and, and new ways of thinking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if I answered that, but I hope. Uh, I think, yes, I, I think you have. Yes, great. Well, thank you so much, Mariana. It's been really interesting. Um, and um, we've had a request actually that we put we 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 write we write down some of the, the names of the designers we've discussed today. So those will go in on the on the YouTube um, recording. We'll we'll make sure we get all those spelt properly. So we'll sort them all out in, out in an email. Um, so well thank you very much it's been a, a thank you for having me and yes. very many thanks for people listening to me I'm, I'm so excited about the fact that a lot of people were going to listen to me and i hope i can inspire some of you to yeah, great. the great horticulture yes. things yes i think you have well thank you thank you so much marianne it's been really nice talking to you thank so you look forward to meeting up with you again somewhere someplace yes. <laughs> soon i hope <laughs> okay bye, bye. I'm blowing her kisses from here. <laughs>